Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, it's, I know we're at an infrastructure conference, so it's nice to see fellow machine learning practitioners or people interested in machine learning. Um, so yeah, welcome to scaling machine, le machine, workflow, machine learning workflows with big data, uh, to big data with Fugue. So we're gonna start off with a demo presented by Han. In this demo, we're gonna start out with a small pandas sized data frame, and then we're gonna apply some business logic to that and, trans and, uh, and bring that into Spark. And in the process, we're gonna see how much of code is needed to bring it to Spark, how much Pandas and Spark are different from each other, and how the, Fugue opens, how the open source library Fugue can help you do this. Change to... Hello everyone, my name is Han Wang, and uh, today I'm going to do a quick demo of some very interesting uh, features of Fugue. And uh, um, I'm going to switch between Python code, Spark code, and Fugue code. Um, it's okay if you are not familiar with, with Spark, and if you cannot follow on the Spark part, because uh, that is just used to compare with Fugue. Um, and I think the most important thing is just to focus on uh, how Fugue solved this problem, how intuitive your own expression should be when you want to solve this problem. Okay, now let's start. The first example is um, we have a very interesting business logic, which I guess if you're working a company, you will always have some tricky logic, uh, where in this logic, we, have, we are going to process a data frame. And here is the business logic. We have four columns, A, B, C, D. They are all strings. And for any given row, if the number of non null values is less than two, then we drop the row. And then otherwise, we concatenate the non null columns in order and output the value as E column. And also keep the original columns. Right? This is not so difficult. And uh, uh, the most intuitive way to express this logic, I think, is in this way. You should take an iterable of lift, uh, uh, sorry, a list of values and then uh, yield uh, those values when it uh, meets the criteria, right? This is just Python code. And also this code is very testable. So now let's just run it. As you can see, the last two rows will be dropped because there are too many nuns. Okay, so this is the logic. And now let's build some um, sample data for us to work on. And you don't have to care about this function just look at this data frame. So this data frame has four columns, A, B, C, D, and uh, it has some nuns, right? So now the question is very simple. How can you apply this function onto this sample data? This is a pandas data frame. You know, even you, know, even you use uh, apply, you cannot directly use apply on this concat, on this function. You have to do some sort of transformation. I don't have, a, uh, I don't uh, put the, solution of pandas here, uh, because we don't have much time. Uh, but uh, now let's directly jump in how Fugue is solving this problem. So remember that the semantic is, I want to apply that function to that data frame, right? It's that simple. Let's see how Fugue is solving that. So in Fugue, we just import transform. We want to apply this concat function onto this pandas data frame, and also specify output schema is the existing schema plus an E column. So that's how Fugue is solving this pandas frame, data frame problem. Okay, now think about that. But in your real production, this data frame can be a Spark data frame because you're probably are processing terabytes of data, right? So when you want to scale to Spark, the first thing you need to do is just initialize a Spark session. So here is for simplicity reason, I just start a local Spark session. But you always have your own way to get a Spark session, right? Okay, so now the question is, how can you apply this function to this data frame using Spark? So look at how Spark is doing this. There are uh, several things. First, you have to bring in this PD sample into Spark, right? And the second, uh, the map partitions has to be um, used on RDD. So you have to convert it to RDD and map, right? And in the map partitions, 
it can only take an uh, iterable of rows. This row is a spark specific class, a tuple. And then you have to do this conversion by yourself so that concat can accept this input type, right? And another thing is after you do all this kind of conversion, you have to convert back the RDD from, from, from the RDD to the Spark data frame. And now here, this is probably the simplest way, oh, sorry, the simplest way to, um, it's probably the simplest way to describe your schema. And I guess a lot of people, if using uh, Spark, you are using a more tedious way to describe this, especially when the schema is complicated. And now, you see, we solve this problem, right? Oh, it's good. And uh, it's over 10 lines of code, additional boilerplate code. But think about that. This is just one function. What if you have a lot of such transformation logics? How much convert boilerplate code do you have to write? Now let's see how Fugue is solving this. As you can see in Fugue, again, it's only the, the transform function. And now, instead of using PD sample, we just use Spark sample. And this is not changed. We still use concat. Schema is not changed. And here we just tell the system, okay, use Spark session to run this transformation. This means uh, I want Fugue to, trans to translate this semantic to Spark operations and to run on Spark. So it's just one line of code and it can solve that problem. And the next example is, um, what if I don't even want to convert the original data frame to Spark data frame? Yeah, actually you can directly say, I want to transform this pandas data frame using this native, Spark function, uh, native Python function, but I want everything happen on Spark. You can also do this. So this, transform this conversion, data conversion, is automatically done uh, on the Fugue level. Okay, so now let's think about another case. What if we have a, we have a business requirement change? Uh, remember that we had A, B, C, D, four columns. Now, for some reason, the column D no longer exists. We don't want column D, right? So now we create another data sample called PD sample two. And PD sample two, what if other business logic is not changed, just, just that we, we missed one column? Will that cause any problems? Actually, if you try the exactly same thing on Spark, you will get an exception. Why? Because the Spark logic, look at this, you have hard-coded too many things. It's not flexible enough. It cannot, um, uh, you cannot, it cannot adapt to this, this changing environment, right? So what you have to do, just for this small change, you have to rewrite your wrapper, and you have to rewrite this output schema, right? So it's so, in real production, you will think, oh, what should I do? Should I just is is this worth it or not, right? It's 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 a struggle to. To, to make the uh, technical decision, right? But what if we want to apply this on Fugue? So look at this, there is no change at all. So you still can apply this pandas data frame with, uh, without D column, and you can still use exactly the same function, transform function, and everything else is the same. This is because in Fugue, for example, the schema, it, this kind of expression is very dynamic already, and it can be determined. Uh, it can be determined by the input uh, data, uh, data frame, and also for the concat because we have the most intuitive expression. So, it's it's actually column agnostic. You can have more columns. You can have less columns. If other things don't change, your functions don't change, and field code don't change. Okay. <laughs> So now let's switch to the second example. We want to do <coughs> machine learning now. Um, so in the second example, <coughs> we, have, um, we have a data frame with many uh, categories. And for each category, it's uh, um, the, the features A, B, C, D, E, and uh, the value, the target, the Y, they have different, uh, they have different uh, uh, relations. So meaning that um, 
ideally, you should train those models separately for each category because they are different machine learning problems. But here, now, first of all, let's just generate that training set and let's take a look. So this is the training set, training data. I have like 400 and test data we have uh, several thousand. And we have the features, um, the ground truth, and also the category. And uh, if it is a train, so for training data is all true, right? So, okay, so now, first of all, let's try to train a logistic regression on the entire data set, on the entire da training data set. Okay, so we train this data set uh, on the entire data set, and also we can write a very simple predictive function predict function on this pandas data frame using this logistic regression model and we can get the prediction right so so here is just very simple python functions it has nothing to do with spark or anything fancy right okay now think about that how can we if if the test data is huge how can we apply this predict function to that huge spark data frame okay so if you want to do that in spark now you can see that the nasty uh, things about Spark uh, schemas. You have to import a lot of like weird, weird uh, classes like struct type, struct field, integer type. So look at this code. What do you do? First of all, you have to bring in this data frame into Spark, and then you have to <laughs> you have to construct a schema. So in Fugue, it's like a star comma the new schema, but here you have to do things in this way. And another thing is. When you, want to, um, when you want to use this predict, you cannot directly use predict because uh, in Spark, um, in Pandas UDF, uh, after 3.2, sorry, sorry, after, after Spark 3, um, you have to have this type of function to work with Pandas UDF. It has to take an iterator of Pandas data frame uh, as input, and you have to return an iterator of Pandas data frame. So, so as you can see that um, we have to write a wrapper for this, just for this purpose, for just for this purpose. Um, and, 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 and in the end, you just, uh, we, you just try to use a select statement to compute the precision, where this is the sum of true positives, and this is the sum of all positive predictions. Okay, so. As you can see, it works, right? But this code is really tedious, and it has a lot of Spark dependencies, right? You, you, with this code, see how many things you have to import from Spark, how many, how many like uh, special data types you have to learn if you want to use Spark, right? But what about Fugue? So again, in Fugue, it's just two lines. The first line is still transform. And transform, we can directly apply on that test data set, no matter it is pandas data frame, Spark data frame, Dask data frame, or QDF, uh, any data frame that Fugue supports. And then the predict function is just that original function, right? And schema. And you can also specify the parameters to pass in the, the, um, the uh, logistic regression, and then spec specify the Spark section. And this, the output of this is native Spark data frames, so you can do exactly the same thing here to compute, to compute the precision. So we reduce this whole lot of code to just one line of code. Okay, and we get the same result. Okay, then we want to do something that's more interesting. So think about that. Um, as I said, for different categories, it's actually a different machine learning problem. What if for different category, we just train a model and then we can apply that specific model to the uh, data frame belongs to that uh, category. So this is how we do that. Uh, and uh, first of all, let's think about Python code. So first of all, given this data frame is a category of training data, right? What do we do? It's, it's straightforward, right? So we just uh, return the category name, which is uh, the first value of this ca uh, category column, because this data frame all have the same category. And then the mod model, what is model? We just pickle, we just pickle this logistic regression model that we train on this category of training data. Right? So we return 
uh, a string and a binary blob. Okay, for predict category. For predict category, when we get a model, when we get a model which is the output of this step, we know what is inside, right? And also this DF is the DF we want to predict on. So, it's, so here we just add an assertion to make sure we don't break anything. Fig doesn't break anything. And then here we just pickle loads this, um, this model, just recover this model from this data structure. And then we just predict on this data frame and assign to the pred column, right? So it's just a simple Python. It has nothing to do with anything else. Okay, now let's see how we use Fugue to orchestrate these two simple Python functions. So it's no longer transform. And actually, to be honest, transform is just one tiny feature of, of Fugue. Fugue covers a lot more things than just uh, transform. So here we use some more advanced features of Fugue. So actually, Fugue is all about direct, directed acyclic graph. So we build a um, Fugue workflow, and we just get the train, and we predict, we partition by category, and then we transform using this tra train uh, cat. Right, so this is the first step. So this step, we distributed train many, many models. And the second step, we just zip this model with this test data set, and then transform. When we transform, we just take in this uh, simple function, which will take two data frames, and then we'll operate on that. So this is a co-transform fugue. And then in the end, this is a similar expression like what we did in uh, Spark, but uh, this expression is framework agnostic. It can work on Pandas, can work on Dask, can work on Spark, can work on any execution engine. So as you can see, after we train and predict per category, the overall precision is much higher than we train a single model on the entire data set. It's almost 10% up, right? And now the last thing I want to talk about is Fugue SQL. Fugue SQL is a different way to express your logic, but it's, it, the SQL will be translated to these operations uh, while well, you can keep your mindset and your semantic all in, uh, all in SQL. Uh, so it's, it's perfect for SQL heavy pipelines where you just need a tiny bit help from um, Python. Um, so for example, in this way, um, we just select, we just construct the, the train date, uh, data set from the original da uh, data, um, the data containing both. And then we just train model. So this is, is exactly what we did here. And then uh, you zip the two uh, data frames and then transform, do the prediction. And then in the end, you just return the result. So here, the only difference is that I, in the end, I want, when I predict, I predict on the entire data set containing the training set and test set. And so he, you see here, I just group by train, group by this, this flag. So we can see, okay, this train, how is the model performance on the training, uh, on the training data set itself? as well as the test data set. As you can see, very simple, we just get, um, for training data sets, we still get better results, which is expected. And for the test data set, we get exactly the same results as what we have. Okay, so this is the end of the demo. So I will let uh, Kevin to talk about some more details. Thank you. What? How do I go to? Hey. So what, what we saw from that demo is that when people move from small, small data, panda-sized data to Spark data frames, even for to implement the same logic, there's a lot of boilerplate code that has to be added, or a lot of times code has to be rewritten. But there's also other, there's also other problems that um, happen from, when transitioning from smaller data to big data, and we'll explore these in this section. So the first is reusability of code. In the top, the top code snippet is how pandas would implement getting the median of each group. And the second one is Spark. And obviously in Spark, there, is, there are added parameters around the tolerance because in a distributed system, getting the median is a very expensive operation. 
So normally you would just use an approximation instead. Second is inconsistency. So with Pandas and Spark, even though they both operate on data frames, they, they have a lot of inconsistent edge cases. So for example, Pandas will join null with null, whereas Spark will not join null records together. When you sort them, Pandas will put nulls at the bottom of the column for both ascending and descending. Spark will treat null values as the biggest value. So it's the bottom uh, when you're ascending and top when you're descending. So even for these types of things, they're different, entirely different systems. And even if you wrap your Pandas code and bring it to Spark, then you may, you may have to still uh, write extra code to deal with these inconsistencies. Uh, second is that, uh, third is that a lot of um, Pandas uh, users are not uh, familiar with the lazy evaluation of Spark. So often you find that, uh, you find that uh, pipelines that have been moved to Spark offer so, often suffer from uh, inefficient computation. So in this, uh, in this graph, computation graph above, if you don't persist B, then it's recomputed three times for C, D, and E when, when those are computed. So of course, if you use persist in Spark, then, then this would be kept in memory and you don't have to recompute it. But Pandas uh, users are not familiar with this concept. Next is partition, partitioning, where often you have to group your logic, put uh, data that belongs to a logical group on the same partition, and this often involves shuffling of da data across your cluster. Uh, so this is something that Pandas doesn't have an interface for and doesn't uh, handle well. Um, in Pandas even, that, which, is very heavy, which is very reliant on the index, you often find that people uh, just use this index as kind of a global um, way to, to locate data, but that, that doesn't hold true in a distributed setting. And of course, testing. Because you have to add all of these like, extra functions to bring Pandas code to Spark or even Python code to Spark, you normally have to add a lot. This is for one function. You have to add minimum of two helper functions. And for each of these functions that you introduce, you have to write additional tests. And you have, it becomes a lot harder to, te to test this um, because it's very coupled to, to these boilerplate functions. And that's why Fugue was created. So Fugue is an abstraction layer for distributed compute. Uh, the goal of Fugue is to, number one, make it easy to use Spark and Dask and also number to unify the inconsistencies that are present between these engines. So in Fugue, we, as Han showed, we want people to be able to describe their logic in Python or Pandas or SQL, and then bring it to Fugue and choose the execution engine. So you can define your workflow in Python or Pandas, and then during runtime, choose, I want to run this on Spark, I want to run this on Dask, without significant code change. And there's interesting properties that uh, that come when, when we can decouple logic and execution. So without Fugue, when you use Pandas, your Pandas code is, is tied to the Pandas execution engine. And when you use PySpark code, your PySpark code is also tied to the Spark execution engine. But when you can decouple logic and execution through Fugue, what happens is that you can just define your logic once and then choose where to run it. So often you find that there are uh, a lot of projects where you know you you started using pandas and the data became too big and now you need to introduce spark and maybe instead of going to spark you'll just vertically scale your infrastructure or on the other hand maybe you're using spark uh, to optimize too early for like a data set as a, a data set that doesn't need spark right so now with fugue you just need to write your code once and define your logic once and then you can choose the execution engine that makes sense during runtime. So you can start small with Pandas, and then you can move to Spark. Uh, so here in this example, we have a, nat a native Python, Python function, or pan it uses Pandas. And what we can see is that uh, when we define the function, there's no Spark dependency whatsoever, and this is what Han demoed. And once you've used the fugue transform function and specify the execution engine, all of this is brought into Spark for you. On this slide, I use a pandas data frame, but for the same function, we can also use native Python using list and dicks. Um, and we can just uh, loop through this list of dicks and apply the Pyth native Python code uh, for each row. And again, this can also be brought into Spark through the transform function. So by decoupling logic and execution, 
you're able to accelerate your testing because you, you can test uh, on smaller data with, with pandas size data and then choose the execution engine on Spark when you need it. You, can, you also need to test less code in general so you can accelerate development. And then you avoid framework lock-in. So today we're using Spark and Dask, but if Ray starts to pick up and a lot of people start to use Ray, or maybe even uh, the uh, QDF with rapids.ai where you have GPU clusters, then we can make, make an execution engine for those different frameworks and your same Python code should be able to map through Fugue. And because, of, because you use native Python code that's very testable, there's a lot less maintenance. There's no Spark expertise required to maintain the code logic. As Han showed, where he had uh, an example of business logic that changed over time, it was very easy to just still use the transform function with Fugue. And then we have a, Fugue also has a SQL interface. So maybe SQL lovers or BI analysts or data analysts, these, these personas can also uh, harness the power of distributed compute. Uh, Fugue SQL supports Spark Dask uh, and Pandas also. And, and then we also support Blazing SQL uh, through, um, uh, to, to operate on top of the uh, GPU, QDF. So with, with, uh, with the SQL interface, what Han showed in the notebook, we have syntax highlighting already implemented. We added keywords to bring SQL into the distributed setting. For example, we added keywords like load, save, persist, partition, and transform. So now SQL can be a first class interface where you can, um, before you would have uh, SQL code pre, uh, sandwiched by predominantly Python code, and now you can have it the other way around where you have predominantly SQL code that invokes Python code occasionally. And this is the example of the notebook extension where we have syntax highlight, highlighting implemented. Uh, so uh, as before I open for questions, I just wanna uh, conclude here by saying that number one, Fugue is also a, is a mindset, first of all, and that our mindset is that we should adapt to the user and allow them to express their logic in whatever way that they want to. And then they can express their logic in a scale agnostic way and we can take care of bringing it to a distributed setting when, when you need to scale. And we value readability and maintainability of the code rather than deep uh, framework specific optimizations. But normally Fugue just uses the mechanisms under the hood of that execution engine so that you don't lose a lot of performance. Um, and with that, I, I, uh, I just wanna give a quick recap before. Um, so number one, we are an abstraction layer for distributed compute. Uh, it adapts to the user, lets them define their code in native Python or SQL, and then bring it to Spark or Dask when needed. And because of decoupling logic and execution, you find that uh, we find that a lot of Fugue users can accelerate uh, their big data projects. Uh, and Fugue is just one component of the broader Fugue project. So we have Fugue and Fugue SQL, but we also have Fugue Tune, which is an abstraction layer for hyperparameter optimization. And we also have Fugue Validate. We also can use Fugue uh, to perform data validation by wrapping around Pandera or Great Expectations. Uh, I just have contact info here, and with that, I'll open the floor for questions. Thank you.